Because you see, when you're taking the pagan religion of the age and using that to, to reinterpret Genesis, that's different than arguing from scripture and trying to come to some conclusions about things. You're taking ideas outside the Bible and deliberately changing the word of God. I think it's a massive problem. And I think it's really symptomatic of the fact that the church by and large does not understand the foundational issues in our culture and have helped that foundational change. The Bible instructs Christians to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But in our Western world, people are not responding to the gospel today as they did in the past. So what has changed? What we're going to find out in this session is that there's a big difference between an Acts 2 type culture and an Acts 17 one. And our Western world today has become much more like an Acts 17 type culture. How do we reach such people with the message of the gospel? Well, the Bible instructs us how to do that. We're going to learn how to effectively preach the gospel to people today. Our heart at Answers in Genesis is evangelism. As I've often said to people, there's no point in converting people to be creationists because creationists will uh, end up in hell just like an atheist if they don't believe and trust in the Creator as Lord and Savior. And so our heart is to preach the gospel and see people one to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in this particular session, I want to share with you my heart concerning evangelism and how do we evangelize a secularized culture? In Psalm 11.3, we read, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And I reminded people about a barn, a barn that had a foundation that was collapsing. And when the foundation collapsed, the structure came down. And I said, that collapsing barn to me represents the collapse of Christian morality, the Christian worldview in our Western world, and certainly in America, the greatest Christianized nation on earth, as we see those moral issues like gay marriage and abortion, and we see Christian symbols being thrown out of public places. We see the culture changing, and really that's what that collapsing barn is symbolic of. And to explain what's happened, we understand that there are really only two religions in the world. You either start with God's word or you start with man's word. And that was the choice right back there in Genesis chapter 3. Trust God's word, don't eat of the tree. Or what was the temptation? You can become as gods. You can decide truth for yourself. No, trust yourself. It's man who determines truth. And on the basis of those two different religions, two different starting points, starting with God's word or man's word, we have two different worldviews. One, a worldview of Christian absolutes. The other, a worldview of moral relativism. But what's happened in our Western world in this era of history, there's been an attack on the foundation, the foundation of the authority of the Word of God. This nation started primarily with uh, founding fathers, many of whom were Christians, but they built their morality on the Bible. Its starting point was really, in that sense, the Bible. That's why a Christian worldview permeated uh, this culture. But we've had generations now, right through our Western world, have been told that the history in the Bible, particularly that history in Genesis 1 to 11, is not true. Evolution is true. Millions of years is true. That history in Genesis 1 to 11 is not true. And subsequent generations have started to recognize if that history in Genesis is not true, then neither is the gospel that's based in that history. And what we see happening in our Western world is a collapse of Christian morality and increase in moral relativism because there's been a change foundationally from God's word to man's word. In this culture, in the education system, in the court system, in the government, and sadly, even in much of the church, the starting point has changed from God's word to man's word. And we're seeing a change in this nation, a change from a predominantly Christian worldview to one now that's predominantly secular with moral relativism pervading the culture. And I summed it up with this castle diagram. And that is that here's the problem. We have the foundation of God's word and the structure of Christianity and the gospel doctrines built on that. Foundation of man's word, secular humanism, moral relativism that comes out of that. There's been an attack. The secularists have really attacked God's word. But that attack has occurred ever since Genesis 3, really. God's word's come under attack since Genesis 3. 
But in this era of history, it's particularly been in Genesis 1 to 11, much of the church has even said, we don't really need that part of the Bible or it doesn't matter. You don't have to take it as literal history. We'll keep the rest of God's word and keep that structure. But like that barn, if we don't have the whole foundation, the structure will collapse. And then we look up here and we say, well, look at all the problems in the culture, but they're not the problems. In essence, they're the symptoms of the problem. And for all the millions of dollars that the church, God's people have spent in this nation trying to fight those issues, ultimately, from a big picture perspective in the nation, it hasn't worked. And why not? Because you see, the secularists captured generations of hearts and minds, changed their hearts and minds in regard to what they believe about the word of God, to believe it's man that should be a starting point, thus changed their worldview, which changed the culture. And what's much of the church tried to do? We tried to go in there and change the culture. But the Bible doesn't say go into all the world and change the culture. The Bible says go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel and make disciples. In other words, Here's the thing, the secularists understand if you capture the hearts and minds of generations of children and give them a different foundation and, and therefore a different worldview, they'll change the culture. What should the church be doing? We should have been raising up generations standing on the authority of the word of God who knew how to defend the faith, who would be the salt and light in the culture. But instead, the secularists have captured them and we've helped that change. We've let them do it. Basically, we handed our children, generations of children, over to the world and, and we've said, you can believe what the world teaches, that's okay, as long as you trust in Jesus, Johnny. And eventually, what do we see happening? Right now, the statistics are at least two-thirds of young people when they reach the, uh, the college age in our churches are walking away from the church. And if this continues, we're going to lose this culture. And we're losing it right now. Now, we, you might say, okay, well then what we need to do is capture their hearts and minds. That's right, that's what we need to do. The secularists know, capture their hearts and minds and we'll capture the culture. Well, we need to go out there and preach the gospel and, 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 and see it, 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 these people saved and wonder the Lord to build their thinking on the Bible, have a Christian worldview so that they will change the culture. That's right. But then I'm going to ask you this. Okay, I'm going to go and preach the gospel. What is the gospel? You might say, oh, well, the gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ died on a cross, raised from the dead. That's true. That's true. The gospel is the good news that Jesus died on a cross, raised from the dead. But isn't it also true that you can't understand the good news of the gospel unless you understand the bad news in Genesis? The bad news concerning a perfect world marred by sin, that the first man, Adam, rebelled, and thus sin came into the world, and thus death is a consequence. That's why we need a savior. That's why Jesus Christ stepped into history. In other words, the history in Genesis 1 to 11 is foundational to understanding the good news. Think about this for a moment. Imagine you were in a church where in that particular church they said, we don't believe Genesis, doesn't matter anyway, but we want you to go out and evangelize the culture. We want to evangelize the generations of kids in this culture. So go out there and tell them about Jesus, but don't mention Genesis. You're not allowed to mention Genesis because we don't believe Genesis. Uh, but go out there and tell them about Jesus. Okay. You sinner, you sinner. You're a sinner. You, you, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a sinner. Why am I a sinner? Because you're a sinner. Where'd that come from? Don't worry about that. Just believe it. You're a sinner. Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. Oh, he did? Yeah. Why do you do that? Because of your sin. Well, where did sin come from? Don't worry about that. Just, just believe it. How do you preach the gospel without that history in Genesis 1 to 11? I mean, if you read 1 Corinthians 15, Romans 5, when Paul's talking about the gospel, uh, the, the good news, and talking about the resurrection, and talking about the last Adam, he's going back to Genesis, because that history there is foundational to all of that. And you know, as a communicator, the first thing you have to um, make sure of is that the words you use, they understand and define them the same way you do. You say, well, that's obvious. Oh, is it, is it really? I mean, do people really think about that? See, I come originally from Australia, and we speak English. Americans speak mm, sort of English, a form of it anyway. But one of the things I learned was we can use the same words in the English language, but in a different culture, they can have different definitions, and so you will not communicate if you don't understand that. I remember one stage when we first moved over here to America, I told somebody I had a flat battery. A flat battery? And they wanted to know if I ran over it. I said, no, I left the lights on. He said, oh, you have a dead battery. Dead? It wasn't alive. How could it die? I... You know, you're not going to communicate if you don't understand the words they use in those situations. And of course, then there's the embarrassing ones, like uh, at the time, this was a number of years ago, of course, when we had little children, and somebody said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm nursing our baby. 
Then there was this silence for a moment on the end of the phone. You know, I was talking on the telephone. Nursing a baby. Yes. Oh. <laughs> See, in Australia, nursing a baby means holding a baby. So I, I was just saying, I'm holding the baby. Over here, I found out it doesn't mean that. <laughs> you know, if you're going to say to somebody the word God, if they don't understand the word the way you do, you're not going to communicate. Or if you say sin, and they don't understand sin the way you do, you're not going to communicate. You see, when I'm thinking about communicating the gospel, I like to think of communicating the gospel in regard to three basic aspects. First of all, the foundational aspect. There's the foundational history that Christ is creator, sin entered the world, death is a result of sin. Actually, that's foundational to understanding why the Son of God stepped into history to be Jesus, the God-man, to die on a cross because death was a penalty for sin, raised from the dead. That's the power of the gospel. And we also know it's a groaning world now because of sin. So one day there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth to come. The foundational knowledge, the power of the gospel, and the hope of the gospel. If I can say this, I, I want us to think carefully about this for a moment. I would suggest to you that most of the church, in fact, in our Western world, in fact, around the world, concentrates mainly on the power and the hope of the gospel, not the foundational aspects. For instance, there was a, a, a series of books. You know, w w when we talk about eschatology, now as soon as I start talking about eschatology, some people get nervous. You're going to come out and tell us a particular view of eschatology and so on. Don't worry, I'm not going to do that because I, I, I just never deal with controversial issues. And so you don't have to worry about that. But there was a particular book series uh, out uh, called the Left Behind series. H how many of you purchased maybe the Left Behind series or even read the Left Behind series? Yeah, there's hands all over the rooms. And you know, millions of Americans purchased that series. I'm not saying you should have, shouldn't have, it's just a matter of history, okay? But you know, millions did purchase that series, which is about a particular view of eschatology, but most of those millions didn't buy creation books. Why? You know, one of the things I found in the church, and I found this in America, and I, I believe it's true in a, in a Western world, people in the church seem more interested in end times than in the beginning. In fact, one of the things I've noticed in America is that there are many churches to become a member of a church, you have to agree to a particular view of eschatology for that particular church. Now, I'm not saying a church shouldn't have a particular view of eschatology. I mean, eschatology is important too. But you, you have, to have, a particular, have to agree to a particular view of eschatology. But when it comes to Genesis, as long as you believe God created... Why is it we put an emphasis on you must have a particular view of eschatology, but when it comes to Genesis, you can believe in millions of years, evolution, doesn't matter, we're not sure what it means, as long as you believe God created eschatology, oh, you've got to have a particular view. Think about that for a moment. Now, I, I do that for this reason. You see, one of the things that I was asked once when I was on radio, it was a Presbyterian minister, actually, and he said to me, now, you agree that... The church can have different views of eschatology. There's pre-mill, R-mill, post-mill, and so on. I said, oh, yeah. And he said, and there's different views of Genesis, theistic evolution, gap theory, day-age theory, and so on. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, it's the same thing. I said, no, it's not. He said, why not? I said, because except for some extreme views of eschatology, for the, for the main views of eschatology, like pre-mill, post-mill, R-mill, you know, in most instances, really people... Uh, are looking at Scripture, they have a high view of Scripture, the authority of Scripture, and they're trying to argue from Scripture, you know, understanding Israel, Daniel, Ezekiel, Revelation, and so on, and looking at Scripture, and, 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 and trying to come to some conclusions there. But the reason that people have different views of Genesis is because they're starting outside of the Bible with the secular views of this age and reinterpreting Genesis and coming up with those different positions to impose the idea of millions of years and so on on the Bible. And so in that sense, if we stand back and think about it, here's a problem. We often find in the church in America, we're prepared to take a particular view of eschatology and say, that's important, but when it comes to Genesis, it doesn't matter. And yet, I would suggest to you that it's because we're not taking a particular stand on Genesis, we're actually unlocking that door to undermine biblical authority in a way that different views of eschatology, by and large, are not. Think about that for a moment. Because, you see, when you're taking the pagan religion of the age and using that to, to reinterpret Genesis, 
That's different than arguing from Scripture and trying to come to some conclusions about things. You're taking ideas outside the Bible and deliberately changing the Word of God. I think it's a massive problem. And I think it's really symptomatic of the fact that the church, by and large, does not understand the foundational issues in our culture and have helped that foundational change. 1 Corinthians 1.23, we read this. We preach Christ crucified under the Jews' a stumbling block, but under the Greeks' foolishness. I want to look at some big picture aspects here tonight regarding the preaching of the gospel. The preaching of the cross was foolishness to the Greeks, but what to the Jews? Stumbling block. What to the Greeks? Foolishness. I want to look at this in a particular way. We're going to look at two sermons. Two sermons where the gospel was preached, number one to the Jews, number two to the Greeks. I want to look at those, Peter taking the gospel to the Jews, Paul taking the gospel to the Greeks. I want to stand back, look at it from a big picture perspective and apply it to our culture in this era of history. And you know, when I do that, I have people afterwards who tell me, it was like a light bulb going off in my head and I, and I sat there and thought, how come we've never seen this before and it's so obvious? When we go to Acts chapter 2, we have Peter here on the day of Pentecost preaching a very powerful sermon. But you can imagine, you know, he's very bold. You can imagine maybe standing on the temple steps or whatever as, as they're coming and, and basically what he said was this, to paraphrase it, you crucified the Son of God. You nailed the Messiah on the cross. You need to repent of your sin. Look what you've done. And God raised him from the dead. And you know, when they heard this, as we read in Acts 2, they were cut to the heart and said, you know, what, what shall we do? And Peter went on to say, repent and so on. And you know what happened? The Bible uh, tells us when, when they were told to be saved and so on, that 3,000 souls were saved. And you say, wow, wouldn't I like to see a crusade like that in my area uh, this week? We used to see crusades like that. We used to see evangelistic campaigns like that. We, we, we've seen great revivals in America, in, in the East in the past, and other places. There's been great revivals in the past. Over in England and, and, and across the United Kingdom and other places in Europe, there's been times where there's been great revivals. But people, we don't see those sort of things today. In fact, I also suggest this to you. Even some of the big evangelistic crusades of the past where, where thousands were, were truly converted and they touched the cultures that, that, uh, that they were ministering to, we don't see the same sort of responses today. In fact, most of those who go to such evangelistic crusades already have a church background. Many of those who go forward are for recommitment. It's a different sort of response today. So here's what we have to ask ourselves. Oda, okay, so Peter preached this message of the gospel, I call it the Acts 2 approach to evangelism. And I want to say this. I would suggest to you that most of what we do in our churches today, our evangelistic campaigns, even our Easter pageants, Christmas pageants, our Sunday school material, Bible study material, youth group material, whatever it is, is basically an Acts 2 approach to evangelism. And what was this Acts 2 approach? Who was Peter really preaching to? Well, he was preaching to mainly Jews or those convinced of or very familiar with the Jewish religion. Let me ask you a question. At that stage in their history... Did they believe in God? When Peter said to that group of people, God, did he have to define God or could he assume they were thinking of the God of creation, the God that he uh, understood? He didn't have to define God, did he? If he said sin, you're, you're sinners, did he have to define sin? They had the law of Moses. They knew what sin was. Sin was idolatry, taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Sin was stealing, murder, adultery. They knew what sin was. They didn't have a problem with the foundational knowledge. They didn't have a problem with that history in Genesis. They believed in Adam and Eve in the fall, by and large. They had the right starting point, which put them on the right road, but their stumbling block was the message of the cross. And I like to put it this way. Peter was preaching to people who already had a foundation to understand the gospel. It'd be like coming in to build a beautiful auditorium like this and somebody already put the foundation there. I remember when they were building the Creation Museum and it was just a piece of property, first of all, and then they seemed to spend months. I don't know what they were doing. They were digging holes and having fun. They were laying the foundation. I thought, this is going to take forever. And suddenly one day I went there and the day before I didn't see anything above ground and that, then that day I suddenly saw all the steel structure going up. Once the foundation's there, the structure can go up very quickly. Peter was coming into a group that had the foundation. 
So from a human perspective, he didn't have to deal with the foundational aspects. He had to deal with the structure that Jesus is the Messiah. To me, that's analogous to this. In 1959, when I was a little boy, very little boy, very, 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 very little boy, in 1959 in Australia, a very famous evangelist came to Australia. What was his name? Billy Graham. Now, again, I'm only talking about this from a perspective of history. I know that people can have different theological views and different issues and so on, but this is from a perspective of history. There is no doubt in Australia's history, it's, it's said that those early crusades in 59 in Sydney and Melbourne that attracted thousands and thousands of people actually touched the culture in a way that's never happened since. In fact, it's been said this is the closest Australia ever came to revival. Australia's never had revival. I mean, I know that Americans pride themselves on the fact that their founding fathers had great convictions. I tell people our founding fathers had great convictions. Um, but they were convictions of a different sort, and they even went to jail for their convictions, if you can understand that. But you see, what was his message? It was mainly an Acts 2 message. It was sort of, if you like, a simple, basic presentation of the power and the hope of the gospel. You're a sinner, trust in Jesus. He died on the cross for you. You need to put your faith and trust in him. And you know what? People were truly converted. He came back and did some other crusades and so on. But you know what's interesting? Those sorts of crusades today don't touch the culture in Australia. In fact, even if they have such, most of those who go forward are already for, just for recommitment. Why was there such a difference in 1959 and the early 60s than today? You know, when I was... A little boy back then went to school. My father was a principal of a schools in Australia. And at that stage in our history, they had prayer on assembly before they went in to the classroom, and they even recited the Lord's Prayer, so we knew we were praying to the God of the Bible. See, Australia inherited the British system, and so we, we built our morality on the Bible, even though it wasn't a Christian nation. Not only that, but the teachers would read through the Bible during the year. So all the students would get to hear about Adam and Eve and sin and hear about the Israelites and hear about Jesus on the cross, the babe in a manger and so on. Here's what I want to suggest to us. Back in the 50s, 60s, Australia was an Acts 2 type culture. So an Acts 2 approach to evangelism from a human perspective, it works. People understood. But if you go to Australia today, it's like America, England, Europe. Creation is basically thrown out of the schools. They used to teach creation in the schools in Australia. The Bible, by and large, has been eliminated from schools. They, they don't have Bible readings like they used to. They don't have prayer and assembly like they used to. In fact, back in the 50s and 60s, if you said to students in Australia, God, most would think the God of the Bible. But if you say God today, it's which God? You mean a Muslim God, a Hindu God, a Shinto God, a Buddhist concept of God, a New Age God? What God are you talking about? It's a different culture. I suggest to you that an Acts 2 approach doesn't work in Australia now like it used to generations ago because Australia is no longer an Acts 2 culture. Australia, I believe, has become an Acts 17 culture. When Paul went to Mars Hill, Athens, and he met there with the Greek philosophers, the Epicureans and the Stoics, and he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection, what was the response? Huh? What, 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 what does this babbler want to say? What is this all about? The response was foolishness. Remember, the preaching of the cross was what to the Jews? A stumbling block. But what to the Greeks? Foolishness. Why the difference? Well, you have to understand, who was he preaching to? Well, the Greek philosophers here, well, what did they believe? Actually, the Epicureans, they believed that everything evolved from the earth, that sensuous pleasure was the chief good of existence and so on. They were evolutionists. See, Darwin didn't invent the idea of evolution. He popularized a particular view of it. The Greeks believed in many gods, and the gods evolved, and we evolved. The Stoics were pantheists. Pantheism is another form of evolutionism. You know what that reminded me of when I went to Japan? I've been to Japan a couple of times, and the first time I went to Japan, my Japanese translator sat down with me and he said, look, when you say the word God, I can't just translate it as God because over here with their Shinto religion and many gods, they'll just see it as another God like all their other gods. I'm going to have to define who God is and define the God of, of, of the Bible. God that made all things and upholds all things by the power of his word and, and separate from the creation and so on. I thought, man, these are going to be long lectures. 
And then he said, if you tell them they're sinners, how will they know what that is? This is not a Christian country. It hasn't had a Christian basis. Also, evolution is taught as fact in the schools, just like it is, you know, all around the world. The problem is they don't have that foundation in God's word. They don't have that history in Genesis. They will not understand. And this is what he said to me. Unless you start at the beginning and define all your terms, they will not understand. See, I was going to a culture that had no foundation to understand the gospel. 